Hello there, I am Zolerla, and this is The Joy of Computer Gaming, where we investigate good and intriguing examples of computer gaming history. Today's highlighted game is Alley Cat, the meow while munching meow on mice, minding meow missiles, making your meow way to meow meet the meow misses game. It is an action minigame game created by Bill Williams and released by Synapse Software in 1983 for the Atari 8-bit. It was also released for MS-DOS in 1984 by IBM. This is a very cute game about playing an alley cat trying to impress and meet up with an uptown girl kitty. The mood of the game was a load of fun playing as a kid, and the theme song is so memorable I created an mp3 of it for my personal playlist for nostalgia's sake. Alley Cat is a minigame game where you play Freddy the Black Alley Cat trying to impress and reach Felicia, the prim white cat. The names and any flavor text for the game are only in the manual. I never read the manual before making the script, so I never even knew the cat's name was Freddy, let alone all of the other names in the game. Every minigame has a brief story behind it, and almost everything has a name, including the white cat that pops out of the garbage cans and each individual mouse on the big cheese. The alley outside is the Catalina Condominiums, the white garbage cat is named Fletcher, the dog is named Bowser Bond Spike, the three mice in the clothesline are Hick, Dick, and Doc, the bird in the aviary is named Petey, and so on. None of the fish or spiders have names though, but at that point it would get a little silly. Moving around is intuitive and responsive and it works very well. You just push the direction to move with up to jump and down to jump down levels where appropriate, or let go of anything you're hanging on. The joystick button is only used in the Pantry, Kennel, and Cupid Room minigames. You use the button to travel through holes in the cheese, drink milk, or pick up and drop presents in those games respectively. In the alley where you start the game, you have to get to a window. Inside will be one of the five different random minigames. The Pantry, the Aviary, the Aquarium Room, the Library, and the Dreaded Kennel. You can immediately leave any of these rooms if you prefer a different minigame. If you complete any of them, then when you get back to the alley, all of the windows instead will show a white kitty, Felicia. This is its own separate minigame called the Cupid Room, so there are technically seven overall. The alley is the part of the game you'll see the most. It's split into two areas, the ground and the windows. At the ground level, you want to jump onto garbage cans as soon as possible because Bowser comes out after you. If he catches you, a cartoony spinning fight shows up and then goes off screen, making you lose a life. On the cans, sometimes Fletcher pops out, knocking you off and alerting the dog. If you make it up to the fence, then you switch to the windows region. Here, there are three clothes lines with mousies running on them that you can eat for points, as well as jump around by clawing onto the clothing. If you hang on to clothing too long, one of the mice may release it, causing you to fall. If you fall all the way back down to the fence, you'll land somewhere behind it and you'll come back out at the bottom again, but at least you don't lose a life. While in the windows region, occasionally a window will open with a goofy sound, and generally something gets tossed at you. Darn cat, get off Ma's clothes! If these hit you, you are stunned, fall behind the fence, and lose a life. Your goal here is to jump into a window while it's open and avoid getting hit by the projectiles, which takes you to another minigame. On the easiest difficulty, there are plenty of cans to hop up, loads of clothes on the clothesline, and the windows throw things slowly and stay open for quite a while. On the hardest difficulty, you can't even get up without going at a run, and the windows open and fleeing things at you rather rapidly. In each of the rooms, there is a broom and a floor at the bottom. The broom will float around and send you flying, so it can get annoying quickly. If you walk around on the floor, you leave paw prints behind, which will distract the broom, but after a little while on it, a dog will come out to try to get you. In the pantry, your goal is to eat four mice by hopping through holes in the cheese. These teleport you between the holes. Which hole takes you where is always the same, though the mice move faster on higher difficulties. In the aviary, your goal is to eat the bird. You first have to knock the bird cage off the table to set the bird free, then you need to catch it. In the aquarium room, you jump into a fish bowl for a new kind of game. Here you have to swim down, eat the fish, but don't get hit by the electric eels. You can run out of breath, shown by your color changing, so get back to the top to breathe. Don't ask how this huge amount of water exists in a simple fish bowl. In the library, you need to hit three vases on top of a huge bookshelf, while dodging two spiders. Once you learn how this works, you can complete this minigame incredibly quickly. And the last basic room type, which only shows up on harder difficulties, is the kennel. This room has several layers for the floor that you can jump between. Your goal is to drink all of the bowls without waking the dogs. They'll peek at you, then growl before attacking, so you are warned ahead of time. A giant milk carton is constantly filling up the bowls, making it take longer. This is by far the most time-consuming and difficult of the minigames, so I generally recommend you pass on it and find a different one to do. It is passable, but it often takes a few minutes to be successful. And again, don't ask how anything you see here makes sense. 
when you complete any of the minigames, you'll get a score which seems to be based on how long you took and which minigame it was. Then you get a single shot at meeting up with Felicia in the Cupid Room. You need to reach the White Kitty at the top. There are a number of levels with Felicia's five brothers on them in the way. You get a gift box for every attempt you've made on the current difficulty. You can carry one at a time and drop it off on a level to make the cat on that level temporarily go away. Maybe it's filled with catnip or something. Each level has hearts for the ground, solid hearts you can stand on, and broken hearts you fall through. If you fall below the bottom, you fail, but at least you don't lose a life. You can cause Felicia's sixth brother to spawn on the bottom by standing around too long as well. Across the top are a number of cupids that randomly fire arrows that convert every heart they touch into broken hearts for the blue cupids or solid hearts for the red cupids. Over time, this makes it darn near impossible to get up. The only tactic I've found that sort of works is spending a little time on one side, then jumping like crazy to get up on the other as fast as you can. I still fail a lot on the harder difficulties because, man, those cats are fast. There are only four difficulty levels, starting from Kitten and ending on Alley Cat. If you complete an Alley Cat level, you just do another Alley Cat level. The intro song is very cute and memorable, especially since it has the cat mewling as part of the song. During gameplay, there's a rapid kind of song playing constantly in the background as you play. It's fast moving and even when you switch between minigames or die, it doesn't get interrupted. The song speeds up and slows down based on what's going on in the game, and it is completely replaced with a rapid snare-like sound when the broom is shoving you around. Most of the sounds seem to sync with the background music, which may just be because it's playing fast, but it actually sounds like it fits together well. The only time the music really stops is when you complete a level by reaching Felicia, and that's because it changes to a different little song and a moment of silence before moving on to the next level. The numerous sound effects are interesting and fun. The dog barking in particular sounds great for the time the game came out. With most of the sounds, they also support a bit of pitch bending, so they do not always sound identical every time, which is especially noticeable with the sounds that happen when the windows open. I'd assume so it sounds like different people shouting at you. This game is very cute and my family enjoyed playing it from time to time while I was growing up because you gotta be a kitty cat. No dancing involved unless the broom counts meow. The feel of jumping around, eating mice, and going through people's apartment windows was fun to do as a kid. When we were younger, we used to play a game with my mother called The Song Game, Meow. Someone would hum a few notes of a song, like the intro music to Ultima 3, or Puff the Magic Dragon by Peter, Paul, and Mary, or something like that. And whoever guessed the fastest got to be the next person to do a song. Of course, Mule's theme was always a popular choice, but the funnest one for everybody to quote-unquote sing was Alley Cat's theme, Meow. We delayed guessing so everybody could mew along with the intro song. I'm not going to do a rendition of this as a grown man. This feels incredibly silly to do alone. Meow. Yeah. But random meows, totally okay. This game is fun in short bursts. You'd play it for about half an hour or so on occasion and have a fun time with it. Meow. Yeah. Trying to put much more time into it, however, would be frustrating. This is unfortunately due to how little there actually is in the game, even if it manages to do that very well. It's because of the fact that there isn't a lot to do in the game, and you won't ever be playing it for very long periods of time, yeah, that I don't really play very much Alley Cat like I do more complicated games like Alibaba, Ultima 3, or Mule. I'd give it a 6 out of 10. It's also fun to say meow randomly. In the MS-DOS version, a lot was lost in the translation due to the limitations of PCs back in 1984. The graphics are done in CGA, giving the game only four colors at a time, and the internal speaker doesn't do the sounds or music justice. In particular, the theme song sounds pretty bad here, and doesn't even have the cat mewling with the music anymore. While playing, there is a soft, brush-like sound going constantly. Graphically, a number of things have changed. The ouch screens look way different and simplified, the score screens are way less interesting, and the cupid room in particular has really changed, with the cupids in fixed positions, Felicia the same color as her brothers, the broken heart platforms change from black to blue when you do if you're carrying a gift, because there's not enough colors, the cats move way less probably due to the smaller width available, and if you give a gift to a cat it just vanishes. All of the other rooms have odd colors and look way less interesting than the Atari equivalents. However, there are lots of extra little animations added to the game. 
Mice have a squeak that appears over them on occasion. Getting attacked by the dog in a room shows a here kitty kitty animation with the dog. And getting to Felicia has a load of hearts that spray across the room. Unlike most older MS-DOS games, this one had a simple speed test in the beginning that gauged how fast your processor was and changed the speed of the game accordingly. I wish more DOS games did this. A completely unrelated game, also named Alley Cat, by John Shea was released for the Commodore 64. However, unlike Alley Cat, this isn't even remotely a good game. After playing it for the four minutes it took to test and record it, I have absolutely no interest in ever playing it again. All you have to do is reach the right edge of the screen for each level. However, jumping doesn't feel very responsive and is a bit ponderous, making the timing of the jumps difficult. The game just has more and more stuff you have to dodge. Nothing about the game feels complete or remotely enjoyable. I'm sorry, Commodore 64 people. If this is what you thought us Atari people were talking about when we were having fun playing Alley Cat, this... this isn't our Alley Cat. Thanks to someone named Sparkle on the Atari Mania website, I'm imagining them as Sparkle from Wizardry 8 now. Duty! Power! Victory! I found out that the Alley Cat theme song is somewhat based on an actual song named The Alley Cat by Bent Fabric, which was created in 1961. For comparison purposes, here's the game's theme song. And here's Bent Fabric's The Alley Cat. This song may be familiar to anybody in Mexico, as it is used by ice cream trucks there. I am including a link to the full song in my description if you want to hear more, since I'm worried Content ID will complain about the 8 or so seconds I've already included. I have no idea how successful Alley Cat itself was as a game, or how many copies it sold. However, apparently Bill Williams only made $600 from the game. I also have no idea how much time or effort he put into making the game, but it doesn't look like it was done over a weekend for certain. The game was originally started by John Harris, the creator of Frogger, who gave up on the project after getting a single screen done. Bill took over and produced the final product. Bill Williams made a number of games in the 1980s, though oddly enough I've never played any of them other than Alley Cat. For the Atari, he also made Necromancer and Salmon Run in 1982. Necromancer in particular seems to have a number of people who consider it one of the best Atari games, but I've never played it before. You create trees and protect them from incoming enemies through a couple of different kinds of levels. It is a bit hard to understand, unfortunately, but you get it after a couple of plays, which don't take very long. Later, he moved on to the Commodore Amiga, which I have never used, so I'm unfamiliar with all of them. There, he created Mindwalker in 1986, which I couldn't figure out at all, Sinbad and the Throne of the Falcon in 1987, The Pioneer Plague in 1988, which has a really cool intro, and then Knights of the Crystallion in 1990, which definitely is strange enough for something of its time, but the very alien-esque feel to it is intriguing. I may have to come back to this game later. Bill created the graphics, music, and sounds for all of his Atari and Amiga games, which were generally admired for being innovative and or unique. His games are certainly unlike anything else I've seen, especially Necromancer, Alley Cat, Mindwalker, and Knights of the Crystallion. He moved on to create a highly animated Monopoly for the NES in 1991, but his last game, Bart's Nightmare, for the Super Nintendo, made him abandon the game industry for good. He called it Bill's Nightmare, as he constantly had to contend with changes that the publisher wanted him to make. When the game was about 90% complete, and after receiving another round of sweeping changes, he gave up and quit. He never produced another game after that. After leaving the world of game development, he got more interested in theology. He moved to Chicago in 1992 to study at the Lutheran School of Theology. He had cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic disease that usually affects the lungs and makes breathing difficult and regularly causes lung infections. The complications of his cystic fibrosis and the air pollution in Chicago caused serious health problems for him, and he had to move out of Chicago before he finished the program he was learning under. He moved to Brockport, Texas after that, but his health continued to deteriorate until he died of complications from the disorder as well as diabetes on May 28, 1998. After his death, with the help of his wife Martha, two books he was writing were published. The first is named Naked Before God, The Return of the Broken Disciple. 
It is considered a very uplifting book on theology that takes a look at the question, why me, God? As Bill explores living with cystic fibrosis to clarify the meaning of grace, suffering, and forgiveness. The second book is Manna in the Wilderness, A Harvest of Hope. Both have nothing but five-star reviews on Amazon, and I've included links to them in the description. Synapse Software was a computer game development and publishing company that operated from 1981 to 1984. During that time, they produced a wide range of games such as Pharaoh's Curse, Shamus and Shamus Case 2, New York City, and Electrician. However, they developed a series of applications for Atari, and when Jack Tramiel purchased Atari's consumer division in 1984, he refused to pay for 40,000 units of software that had been shipped by Synapse. This threw Synapse into a cash crisis, and they were purchased by Broderbund Software in late 1984. Synapse at the time was releasing a number of text-based adventure games, and since the market changed away from them being a viable product, Broderbund closed Synapse down about a year after purchasing them.